Red Brick Media. All quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawah work. Support us by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala sayyidi khalqillahi ajma'in Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man sara ala sabilihi wa nahjih Astanna bi sunnatihi wa ahtata bi hadihi la yawmiddin Wa sallama tasliman kathira amma ba'd a couple of weeks ago, before we took this break, um, we began with Kitab al-Siyam, the book of fasting. And I think we were on hadith number 552, is that correct? Does anyone know what hadith we were on? We have a different numbering. What was the last hadith we took? Man lam yad'a qawla zur. Okay, enjoy. Okay. So the next hadith... Hadith number 552, and as we said before, uh, so far what we've taken is basically an introduction into the chapter of fasting and some other issues concerning fasting such as suhoor and such as iftar and some of the other issues concerning fasting. And now what Ibn Hajj rahimahullah, what the author was going to go into was the mufattirat, those things that break your fast. But before he actually went into what breaks your fast, he mentioned the previous hadith, the last hadith that we took, the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, man lam yada'a qawla al-zuri wal-amala bih, falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada'a ta'amahu wa sharaba. Whosoever does leave a false testimony and acting in accordance with that, then Allah has no need that he should leave off his food and drink. And we said that the reason why Ibn Hajar rahimahullah brought that hadith here was as an introduction into this mini chapter of what breaks your fasts. So by ijma, by consensus of the scholars, someone who lies whilst fasting, someone who gives false testimony, someone, for example, who steals, and so on and so forth, their fast is correct, meaning that their fast doesn't become null and void by performing other sins. However, no doubt that reward will be lessened. The reward of that fast will be lessened in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the extent that the Prophet sallallahu is saying that if in the state of Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan and in the state of fasting, at a time when a person should be closest to their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, that fasting and that month of Ramadan, the heightened sense of spirituality, the fact that the doors of Jahannam are closed and the gates of paradise are open, the fact that the shayateen, the devils have been chained, even if that, all of that cannot stop a person then from, from committing and performing major sins, then what benefit is it that that person should fast? What's the point of them not eating and drinking when they can't abstain from such major and abhorrent sins? And so even though false testimony doesn't break your fast, because of its severity, Ibn Hajj mentions that hadith here. So then what about those things which break your fast? meaning those things that you do intentionally in order to break your fast. So that hadith, hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, was like a mini introduction into this section of the chapter. Hadith number 552, and this is where we stopped last time. On the authority of Aish radiallahu anha, qalat, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقبل وهو صائم ويباشر وهو صائم ولكنه كان أملككم لإربه متفق عليه واللفظ لمسلم وزاد في رواية في رمضان On the authority of our mother Aisha رضي الله عنها who said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would kiss whilst he was fasting and he would fondle whilst he was fasting and he was the one who would most be able to control his desires and this is collected by Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their two sahihs the wording is of Imam Muslim and in a narration she said in the month of Ramadan. So now we're going into those issues which break a person's fast. Some of those issues, there is consensus concerning them. There is ijma amongst the scholars that they break your fast. For example, a person who eats intentionally, another person drinks intentionally, another person has marital relations intentionally. These things break your fast by ijma, by consensus of the Muslim scholars. And because they are so well known, Ibn Hajj doesn't really mention them here. 
Because if you remember at the beginning of the chapter, he brought verses from Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned some of those things. And so he's not going to repeat them here again. They're well known. And it's ijma, there's consensus of the scholars of Islam. There are other things, other things which the scholars have differed over. Do they break a person's fast or not? Or they may break a, fast in, uh, a person's fast in certain situations and may not break the fast in other situations. So these are the things that Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, is concentrating on here. The first issue is what happens if someone does something other than marital relations? So a husband with the wife, the wife with the husband, below marital relations, less than marital relations, they kiss, they fondle and so on and so forth whilst they are fasting. Does that break the fast or not? Is it allowed or not? This is what the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha is speaking about. And so in this hadith, she explicitly says, and the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would kiss whilst he was fasting and he would fondle his wives whilst he was fasting. But he was the most able to control his desires bi abi hu wa ummi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there is another hadith similar to this, which even though Ibn Hajj rahimahullah doesn't bring, will mention in the Sunan of Abi Dawood that two men came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one after the other. One was a man old in age, the other was a man young in age. Both of them asked this same question, O Messenger of Allah, can we kiss our spouses whilst in the state of fasting, whilst in Ramadan, whilst we are fasting? To the old man, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, yes, you may kiss her. To the young man, he said, no, you may not kiss her. And so the companion said, why is it that two men come with the same question? You give two different rulings. And here we see what is known as the fiqh of fatwa, the, the knowledge and the science of giving fatwa, giving religious rulings. Sometimes you give two different rulings to exactly the same question based upon the circumstance. And so here the Prophet ﷺ has the same question from two different people, two different answers. Why? One was old, one was young. One was more able to control his desires, the other was not. So to the older man, he said, yes, you may kiss your wife. To the younger one, he said, no. And so based upon this, the scholars of Islam have differed concerning this issue. Is it allowed to kiss a person's wife in the state of fasting or not? And all of it comes back to this issue of being able to control yourself or not. If that kissing is going to lead to arousal and lead to other things, then it is not allowed. And if that kissing won't lead to anything else, then it is allowed. This is basically the criterion and the fossil in this issue. How do we differentiate between these issues? It is dependent upon an individual basis. Person by person, each person knows himself better. If it will lead to arousal and other things, then no. He should stay away. If he doesn't, or if it will lead to something else, then he should refrain from kissing his spouse. And so the scholars of Islam have mentioned this, the issue of kissing and so on, and they have defined it in three categories. Number one is someone who kisses and nothing happens. They don't get aroused. Nothing will come out from their private parts, no liquids will come out, nothing will happen. For this person, it is allowed. And the fasting is correct, it is sahih, and there is no harm in it. And this is what Aisha radiallahu anha is saying about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The second issue is that it will lead to arousal, but nothing more. It will lead to arousal, but nothing more. In this case, a person shouldn't kiss. However, the fast is still correct. So even if it leads to arousal, the fasting is still correct. The fast is not broken. However, that reward will be diminished because now they have done something which they should have avoided in the month of Ramadan. The third issue or the third category is that it leads to arousal and more, meaning it may lead to ejaculation, it may lead to other things. What happens in this case, then the fasting is, if it leads to ejaculation, then the fasting is Null and void by consensus of the scholars of Islam. So these are the three categories when it comes to the issue of kissing in the month of Ramadan and in the state of fasting. The next three hadith we will take together because they're all on the same issue. Hadith number 553. Bukhari. 
on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam got cupped whilst in the state of ihram and he got cupped whilst he was fasting collected by Al-Bukhari. Hadith number 554 wa'an Shaddad ibn Aws radiyallahu an an nabiya sallallahu alayhi wasallam ata ala rajulin bil baqi' wa huwa yahtajimu fi ramadana faqal aftar al-hajimu wal mahjum rawahu al-khamsa illa al-tirmidhi wa sahahu Ahmad wa ibn Khuzayma wa ibn Hibban. And the authority of Shaddad ibn Aws radiyallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed by a man in Baqir, the graveyard of Baqir, and he was getting cupped in the month of Ramadan. So he said that both of you, the one who gets cupped and the one who is doing the cupping, both of you have broken your fast. And this is collected by the five except the Tirmidhi and it is authenticated by Imam Ahmad and Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn Hibban. Hadith number 555 وعن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه قال أول ما كرهت الحجامة للصائم أن جعفر بن أبي طالب احتجم وهو الصائم فمر به النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أفطر هذان ثم رخص النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بعد في الحجامة للصائم وكان أنس يحتجم وهو صائم رواه الدار قطني وقواه and the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said that at the beginning of Islam it was disliked that a person should get cupped in the state of fasting. And that was because Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an was getting cupped whilst he was fasting. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed by him and he said, both of you have broken your fast, meaning the one who is doing the cupping and Ja'far himself. But then later on, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam allowed for the one who is fasting to get cupped and Anas radiallahu an would get cupped whilst he was fasting, collected by ad Qutni. These three ahadith, all of them are very similar in their content and all of them speak about the same issue and that is cupping whilst in the state of fasting. I assume everyone knows what cupping is, hijama. And that is where a person comes and using fire they take out or dry cupping or wet cupping depending on the type of cupping they remove ill blood or blood which is impure from the body and it can be done from more or less any part of the body this is a sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it is supposed to have health benefits in it as well the issue here is though can it be done in the state of fasting whilst a person is fasting in the month of ramadan or outside of the month of ramadan we have three ahadith here, and each one of them gives a slightly different ruling. The first, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, is that the Prophet ﷺ used to take hijama whilst in the state of ihram, meaning when he would go for umrah or hajj, and whilst he was fasting. And this is collected by Al Imam al Bukhari. This hadith, it is authentic up to the statement that he would take hijama in the state of ihram. As for the last statement that he would take hijama whilst fasting, the scholars of hadith have differed over this particular wording. Is this authentic or not? If you go back to Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith which is in both Bukhari and Muslim, it only mentions the state of ihram, not the state of fasting. And so some of the scholars like Imam Ahmad and other scholars of the hadith, they said that this addition of fasting is weak in this hadith. That the authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim is only up to that he would make hijama in the state of ihram. In the state of ihram whilst he would go for umrah or hajj. As for the last part, then that is a weak addition. So that's the first hadith. The second hadith is an authentic hadith. And that is the hadith of Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the one who gets cupped and the one who does the cupping, both of them, have broken their fasts. And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah said, this hadith is the most authentic hadith in this chapter, meaning in this issue of hijama, that both of them have broken their fasts, the one who does the cupping and the one who is getting cupped. The last hadith, the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, the scholars of hadith have differed over its authenticity. Some of them said that it is authentic, Others such as Al-Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah and others said it is weak. And the issue is because of this narration that refers back to Ja'far Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. And it says that Ja'far Ibn Abi Talib on the day of the conquest of Mecca, Yom Fathi Mecca, in the eighth year of the Hijrah, he was getting cupped and the Prophet sallam saw him and this is what he said to him. The scholars said that it is well known that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was martyred before the conquest of Mecca. He was martyred on the day of Mu'tah, 
which was a year or two before the conquest of Mecca. And so he, radiallahu anhu arda, died before the day of the conquest of Mecca. And therefore, they say that this hadith is weak. Therefore, they say that this hadith is weak. And so it would seem that the only authentic hadith is the hadith of Shaddad ibn Aws, radiallahu anhu, which says that both the one who gets cupped and the one who does the cupping have broken their fast. However, anyway, there are three hadith. Each one of them gives a different ruling. The first one says that it is allowed for you to get cupped. There is no harm. The second one says that it is not allowed, completely the opposite ruling. And the third hadith says that it is disliked. Three hadith, three different rulings. So how do you reconcile between all three? The reconciliation is by looking at the hadith. The first hadith, we say that that addition of the fasting person doing hijama and it being allowed for him is weak. So therefore the hadith is taken out. The second hadith is authentic. As Imam al-Bukhari said, it is the most authentic hadith in this chapter. Even though he doesn't narrate it himself in Sahih al-Bukhari. Whereas that first hadith, he does narrate. He says this hadith is more authentic in this issue. And the third hadith, the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, we said, has some discrepancies in it and it seems to be weak. And so therefore, the issue or the correct opinion in this issue, and Allah knows best, and there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars, is that hijama will break your fasting. Cupping will break your fasting. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he says that this is also in concurrence with the qiyas, with analogy when it comes to what breaks fasting. When you look at what breaks fasting, it can be categorized into two main categories. Number one, things that you add to your body, that you take into your body, and number two, things that you remove from your body. Either way, it will weaken or strengthen your body. So these are the two categories, things which strengthen your body because you take them in like food and drink and so on, or things which weaken your body because they are removed. Like for example, ejaculation, like for example, cupping. So if a lot of blood is removed, then it weakens the body. So likewise, even based on analogy, when you look at all of the things that are fasting, they fall under these two categories. Number one, things which strengthen the body, eating, drinking, and so on. Number two, things which weaken the body, like ejaculation, like for example, cupping, and so on, like for example, vomiting, and we will go on to that issue as well. These are things which weaken the body. And so anything which falls into this, and then you can make qiyas on this for anything else. Like for example, if someone was to take an injection which had some type of nourishment in it, it gave you strength, that would fall under one of these categories. And so on and so forth. You can make qiyas on this. So based upon this as well, even analogy from the analytical point of view, hijama is something which breaks fasting because it is a lot of blood which is removed from the body and it is something which weakens the body. And obviously this is also in accordance to this hadith that we said of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So hijama is something which breaks the fast and there is a stronger of the two opinions. And as I said, there is a difference of opinion on this issue and Allah knows best. Hadith number 556. When Aisha radiallahu anha an nabiya sallallahu alayhi wasallam iktahala fi Ramadan wa huwa sa'im. رواه ابن ماجه بإسناد ضعيف وقال الترمذي لا يصح في هذا الباب شيء عند ثورة عائشة رضي الله عنها that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used kuhul in the month of Ramadan whilst he was fasting collected by Ibn Majah with a weak, with a weak chain of narration and Imam al-Tirmidhi said there is nothing authentic in this chapter or on this issue this hadith again is one of those things which the scholars have differed over concerning whether it breaks the fasting or not. And that is kuhul. What is kuhul? That type of ointment that you apply to your eyes. Right? And so women do it and men do it as well. And in the time of the Prophet wasallam, the men would apply this onto their eyes. Does this break the fast or not? In this chapter, there are three hadith. Even though one, only one is mentioned by Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, there are three ahadith on this issue. The first is this hadith of Aisha, which we said is weak, collected by Ibn Majah, and it is a weak hadith. The second is the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came out to the companions in the month of Ramadan, and he was wearing kuhul in both of his eyes. And this hadith is also weak. 
The third hadith is the hadith of Ma'bad that the Prophet wasallam told people that he should wear kuhul before they go to sleep unless they are fasting. And again, this hadith is weak. So all three hadith on this issue are weak. And that's why Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah said, as is mentioned by Ibn Hajar, لا يصح في هذا الباب شيء. There is no authentic hadith in this issue. So all of the hadith that are narrated on this issue are weak. So therefore, we go back to the original ruling, and that is that kuhul doesn't break your fast. Kuhul doesn't break your fast because in order for it to break the fast, there must be an evidence from the Prophet wasallam, And because there isn't, then it doesn't break your fast. Based upon this, the scholars have made qiyas on things like eye drops and ear drops and so on. That they are also allowed and that they don't break your fast as well based on qiyas of this, of this issue of kuhul and Allah knows best. The next hadith, hadith number 557, وَعَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ نَسِيَ وَهُوَ الصَّائِمْ فَأَكَلَ أَوْ شَرِبْ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَوْمَهُ فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ وَسَقَاهُ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ وَلِلْحَاكِمْ مَنْ أَفْطَرَ فِي رَمَضَانَ نَاسِيَهُ فَلَا قَضَاءَ عَلَيْهِ وَلَا كَفَّارَ وَهُوَ صحيح. On the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whosoever forgets whilst they are fasting and they eat or drink, then let them complete their fasting for indeed Allah has given them food and drink. And this is collected in Bukhari and Muslim. And in, in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, there is an addition that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whoever breaks their fast in Ramadan forgetfully, then they don't have to repeat the fast nor do they have to give an expiation and this is also authentic this hadith refers to another issue now and that is the issue of the, the nasi is the one who forgets and likewise you can add to that the makro the one who is forced these two people in the sharia have their own separate rulings the one who forgets the forgetful one and the one who is forced so the general ruling in the Sharia is that the one who eats and drinks has uh, eats or drinks has broken their fast. So if you eat or drink, you have broken your fast. This issue now refers to the one who forgets. So a person comes and they eat in the day that they are fasting. In the month of Ramadan, for example, they eat. Whether it's a little bit or a great amount, small amount or great amount, whether they eat to their fill or they don't. Whatever they eat, so long as they are forgetful. Then after they have finished eating or drinking, or whilst they're eating or drinking, they remember that they're fasting. So they stop. Has that broken their fast now or not? According to this hadith and the opinion of the majority of the scholars of Islam, no. They haven't broken their fast. And so they don't have to repeat their fast, nor do they have to give an expiation. Meaning they don't have to feed someone or do anything else. Their fast is sahih, it is complete, it is correct and they continue fasting as normal, and they make iftar as normal. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, فَلْيُتِمَّ صَوْمَ Let him continue to fast, for indeed it is Allah that gave them something to eat or drink. So based upon this as well, we can make analogy on another issue, and that is a person who is forced to eat or drink. If such an issue ever arises, that a person is fasting and someone comes and they threaten their life, and they say, that unless you eat or drink, I will do this to you, I will harm you, I will kill you, and so on. Can they eat and drink? Yes. Does that break their fast? No. So the scholars upon this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an have also placed the issue of the one who has marital relations in the month of Ramadan or whilst they're fasting forgetfully. If that were to occur, would their fasting also be null and void? No. If they did it whilst in a state of forgetfulness, then no, their fasting is correct and it is sahih and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Hadith number 558, وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من ذرعه القي فلا قضاء عليه ومن استقاء فعليه القضاء رواه الخمسة وعله أحمد وقواه الدار قطني on the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whosoever is overcome by vomiting, then they don't have to make up their fast. And whosoever makes themselves vomit, then they must repeat their fast, collected by the five 
and Imam Ahmad said it is weak, but Imam Dar Qutni said it is authentic. This hadith, there is a difference of opinion over concerning whether it is authentic or not, and it seems, and Allah knows best, that the hadith is hasan, that it is of a sound chain of narration. And basically, what the hadith is saying is that vomiting is of two types. Either you're overcome by vomiting, meaning that it's not of your choice, but a person's ill and the vomit overcomes him and they vomit. Not out of choice, but out of, uh, because of their illness and so on. Or the second choice is, is that they make themselves vomit. Either by placing their finger down their throat or some other way, they make themselves vomit. Now in these two issues, the Prophet ﷺ has differentiated between the two. And this hadith is similar to the previous one. In the sense that, why? Because as we said in the previous one, that if you're forgetful, then your fasting isn't broken. And if you're forced, your fasting isn't broken. Now in this hadith, if a person is overcome by vomiting, then it's like they're being forced. So can you see the connection now between this hadith and the previous hadith that Ibn Hajar brings? That if you're forced, you're overcome by vomiting, it's not out of choice, it's like you're being forced. And so you take the ruling of the one who is forced. So therefore, you're, even though it will weaken you, even though it should be one of the mufattirat, one of the things that breaks your fast, because you have done it not out of choice, out of forgetfulness, or out of being compelled, then your fasting is sahih. It is correct and it's not broken. However, if someone was to make themselves vomit, intentionally vomit, then their fasting would be broken and they would have to repeat that day and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next hadith, hadith number 559, Mu'an Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiyallahu anhuma, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama خرج عام الفتح إلى مكة في رمضان فصام حتى بلغ قراع الغمين فصام الناس ثم دعا بقدح من ماء فرفعه حتى نظر الناس إليه فشرب ثم قيل له بعد ذلك إن بعض الناس قد صام فقال أولئك العصاه أولئك العصاه وفي لفظ فقيل له إن الناس قد شق عليهم الصيام وإنما ينتظرون فيما فعلت Muslim. On the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah anhuma, that the Prophet وسلم, came out of Mecca in the year of the conquest, in the eighth year of the Hijrah, in the month of Ramadan, and he continued to fast until he reached a place called Qura al Ghamim, and the people, meaning the companions, were fasting with him. And then he ordered that a bowl of water be brought forth and then he raised it until the people could see and then he began to drink. And then it was said to him after this that some people still continue to fast. He said they, they are the disobedient or those are the disobedient, those are the disobedient. And in another wording it was said to him that the people find it difficult to fast and they are waiting for you to see what you do. So he ordered that a, a pot of water be bought after Salatul Asr and he drank from it, collected by Imam Muslim. We'll also take the next hadith 560 because it's similar. And that is the hadith of Hamza ibn Amr al-Astami radiyallahu an. Annahu qala ya Rasulallah inni ajidu fi quwwatan ala al-siyami fi al-safar fahal alayya junah. Faqala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hiya rukhsatun min Allah. فمن أخذ بها فحسن ومن أحب أن يصوم فلا جناح عليه رواه مسلم وأصله في المتفق عليه من حديث عائشة أن حمزة ابن عمر سأل. This hadith of Hamza ibn Amr al Aslami رضي الله عنه he said O Messenger of Allah I find that I have strength to fast whilst I am travelling so is there any harm in that? The Prophet ﷺ replied, It is a concession from Allah. Whoever takes from it, it is good. And whoever wishes to fast, then there is no harm in doing so. Collected by Imam Muslim. And the origin of this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. These two hadith speak about another issue now, and that is the issue of concessions. And that is, as we know, if a person is ill, or if they're, if they're traveling, it is allowed for them to break their fast. It is allowed for them to break their fast. And this is mentioned in the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ Whoever is ill or is traveling, then they make up those days after the month of Ramadan. 
So each day that you miss, you make it up after the month of Ramadan. However, the issue in this hadith and in the next hadith of Hamza ibn Amr radiallahu an is what if a person chooses to fast? So even though the concession is there, person is traveling, the concession is there, they can break their fast. However, they choose to fast, not to break their fast, not to take the concession, but to fast. Is it allowed or not? In this hadith, the first hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma, it is as if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is saying, don't fast, break your fast. And that is that in the year of the conquest of Mecca and the eighth year of the Hijrah, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was in Mecca, he left on his way back to Medina. And when he passed a place called Qura al ghamim which today is known as Wadi Asfan, if you travel by road from Mecca to Medina, you will see a signpost for a small village called Wadi Asfan, roughly about 60 kilometers side of Mecca in the direction of Medina. When they reached this area, then it was said to the Prophet ﷺ that the companions are finding it difficult to fast because obviously it was hot, the desert, they would be walking. It's difficult for them to fast. However, because of the love that they had for the Prophet ﷺ and how closely they wanted to follow his sunnah, if he was fasting, they would fast. Just as you have the other hadith in the Sulh of Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where the companions were wearing their ihram, even after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ said to them, we're not performing Umrah, take off your ihram, we're going back to Medina. The companions refused to do so. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was still wearing his ihram. Until his wife told him that you should start first, take off your ihram, and when they see you taking off your ihram, they will follow. So the Prophet ﷺ took her advice, he took off his ihram, and when the companions saw this, they took off their ihrams as well. This is how closely they followed the Prophet ﷺ and how much they loved him. And so likewise in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is fasting, so they want to fast as well. And that's why in the other narration, they said, O Messenger of Allah, they're waiting to see what you will do. If you continue to fast, they will continue to do so, even though there is so much hardship in it. However, if you break your fast, they will follow you. And so the Prophet wasallam bought some water and he drank from it. And then anyone that was still fasting, he said, those people are disobedient, those people are disobedient. However, in the next hadith of Hamza ibn Amr al islami and both of these hadith are authentic, the Prophet wasallam is saying that if a person wishes to fast whilst they're traveling, then it is allowed for them to do so. So this issue here is something which the scholars have differed over. Is it better to fast or is it not better to fast? There is a hadith of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna Allah yuhibbu an yu'khadha rukhasa. Indeed Allah loves that his concessions should be taken. So therefore if a person is ill, they have a concession that they can sit down and pray. They have a concession that they don't have to fast. They have a concession that they can shorten the prayers and combine their prayers if they're traveling. Allah loves that people should take the concessions that he gives to them. However, if a person has the ability and they have the strength and they have the energy to fast whilst they're traveling or to fast whilst they're ill, is it allowed for them to do so? This is what the scholars have differed over. No doubt it is allowed for them to do so. This is by ijma'. And so even this first hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, the scholars said, the, the Prophet ﷺ was saying he was disliked. When he was referring to those companions as being disobedient, he wanted to show that it was disliked for them to fast in a state in which they found hardship. So if a person finds it difficult to fast, then it is disliked. If a person can't fast whilst they're traveling, yet they insist on doing so, it is disliked. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants ease for you and not hardship. And Allah says, ما جعل عليكم في الدين من حرج. Allah has not placed hardship and burden upon you in your religion. So if a person finds it difficult, then no. It is not from the Sharia that a person should place that burden upon themselves. However, if a person is able to fast and they don't have any difficulty in fasting, they don't find any hardship, then it is allowed for them to fast. However, is it better or not? This is where the scholars differ. Some of them said it is better for him to fast if he is able to, because whilst in this difficult, difficult time of traveling, if he fasts, Allah will give him more reward, because he's putting in more effort. Others said no. 
It is better for him not to fast because of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that that is something which is more beloved to me. And some of the scholars like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, they combined between the two and they said that a person should do what is easiest for them. If it is easy for them to fast, then that is better. If it is easy for them not to fast, then that is better. And so they reconciled between these ahadith and they said that it again goes back to an individual basis, person by person. So if you find it easier to fast, then that is better and more beloved to Allah. If you find it easier not to fast, then that is better and more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so a person does what is easier for them and Allah azza wa jal knows best. And inshallah with that we'll conclude and inshallah tomorrow uh, after Maghrib, inshallah, we'll continue with the remainder of these hadith. Wa sallallahu wa sallam bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 